morning, everyone. I would like to welcome all of you to our mask Zoom meeting, mask ultrasound Zoom meeting. And we are so privileged to have uh, with us a very uh, prominent uh, exercise uh, and sports uh, physician in the person of Dr. Jenny Saunders of Australia. He has uh, been working with a lot of national teams to elite sporting competitions overseas. She has accompanied the Australian Olympic team to several Olympic games. She has also taken care for several national teams at World Championships. Her interests include the use of regenerative medicine technologies and diagnosis and treatment of sacroiliac joint mechanical incompetence. She has published extensively on this topic and has completed her doctoral thesis on sacroiliac joint injury with the award of her PhD. Administratively, she is the immediate past chair of the Overseas Trained Doctors Assessment Committee, as well as a member of the Research Committee and is a past secretary of this college. She was formerly on the board of censors for the Australian College of Sports Physicians for many years. She has been awarded Australian Sports Medal by the Australian Commonwealth Government for services to sports medicine and was recently awarded the Ken Crichton Citation for Distinguished Service for the Australasian College of Sports and Exercise Medicine. So ladies and gentlemen, we are so honored and privileged to listen to Dr. Jeannie Saunders. But before we do so, let us just pause for a moment for a short prayer. Let's pray. Our gracious Father in heaven, we thank you for this beautiful day. We thank you, O oh God, for giving us this time to learn and listen to our friend, Dr. Jenny Saunders, who will speak to us about sacroiliac joint, kindly give her wisdom and understanding for above, and kindly be with her throughout her lecture, and be with the rest of us in our challenges in this COVID. Thank you for your grace and your goodness. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Dr. Jenny Saunders, welcome to our Mass Cultures on Zoom. It's all yours now. Thank you. Thank you for that lovely introduction. And uh, thank you for having me. It's uh, lovely to get the opportunity to talk to my uh, international friends. Um, let's see if I can... Okay, so the points I would like to make is that it's much more complicated than we were initially taught when uh, we were at med school. Um, so. It's an enduring challenge and it involves up to 30% of non-specific low back pain, which is twice the amount of discal injury, which is where most of the research um, has been uh, concentrated in the last uh, 30 years. Um, the sacroiliac joint began to be really investigated uh, from about 1992 when the first international conference was held. And this is a multidisciplinary conference that's held every three years and it is really quite a, a wonderful conference to attend. The next one will be in Melbourne in uh, two years time. So let's talk a little bit about uh, the incidents and you can see here that I've summarized the literature for you and I'm happy to send uh, these slides as PDF if you're interested. I can send them to Gemlo and he can um, uh, distribute them. So we can see that there's quite a lot of difference. Um, in Schwartz have found that it was 13%, but he was using double blind injection techniques. Uh, so long acting and short acting locals to see if there was um, uh, concordant relief of pain. However, we know that injections into the synovial portion of the sacroiliac joint are not necessarily diagnostic, thanks to our good friend Murakami in Japan. Uh, you can see that in pregnancy it goes way up and up to 50% of currently pregnant women will have pain. It drops to one third post, post uh, partum, but at three months postpartum you've still got one third of women who have the pain uh, and, and uh, classified as moderate to severe pain and within a year that's probably dropped to around about 20% with decreased pain. Um, so you can see that the um, prevalence is quite high, but it's not just pregnant women. It also can occur with trauma. Uh, so a fall onto the buttocks, a motor vehicle accident, particularly rear enders where the foot's on the uh, pedal, or repetitive microtrauma. So in athletes, uh, people who constantly jump and land, we see it in dancers, uh, hurdlers, basketball players, um, anybody who's constantly landing and getting that repetitive microtrauma. We see it here in Australia, a lot in our rugby players, because they're always being 
or frequently being pushed onto their onto their buttocks um, in a tackle. Um, in the past, we've always just looked for localized pain around the sacroiliac joint, but we do know that it, this condition is referred to as pseudosciatica, uh, and it does have referral to the leg. And often the presentation may be quite uh, distance in time from the trauma received, and they don't often seek help until all their accommodative strategies start to fail. So we'll go into that in a bit more. So these are the types of trauma we see. Uh, the slip and splits on wet tiles, the fall onto the buttocks, the motor vehicle accidents we've talked about, and also the remoteness between the trauma and the presentation. So in sports, we uh, have the multiple micro traumas occurring in basketballers, netballers, dancers, gymnasts, hurdlers, long jumpers. The gymnasts have two sources of injury, their repetitive landing and also they fall off uh, their apparatus a bit as well. So how does it actually present? What, what are the pain presentations? Well, this is the work of Fortin from 1994. And on this diagram here on the uh, my left hand side, you can see he injected hypertonic saline into the synovial joint of asymptomatic controls. And you can see that the pain referral was actually quite localized. But when he injected it into, and in the other map on the side, he had 54 symptomatic patients that he injected hypertonic saline into the synovial joint. And this is the referral pattern he got. He got it referring down to the posterior thigh. So he was able to show that patients with symptomatic SIJ do get referral. Now this is Murakami's work, which is just superb. And he had a hundred consecutive patients uh, and the top uh, pain shows pain. The bottom uh, diagrams show where people felt pins and needles or leg numbness. And you can see that the majority get pain in the localized area. So that's 94 out of 100. Uh, and if you add the other four, they still in that localized area. But you can see that um, over a third referred to the lateral leg, even right down as far as the foot a minimal of people, 3%, but still there. And then you've got this 23% um, referring to the groin. Um, and this is something I've also noticed. And in my work, in my published work, I basically got the same distribution as Murakami, though with half the number of patients. So you can see that it's, it's uh, a lot more um, than just pain at the localized region. And I'd strongly suggest to you that if you are seeing a patient who has leg pain, along with their buttock pain, that you consider this as a diagnosis and you should clinically examine for it. Don't just assume it's going to be discal or due to the lumbar spine. So what does it do? It connects the spine to the pelvis. Uh, it provides a mechanism to transfer the weight of the trunk to the leg. It also assists with torsion of the pelvis in walking. And all of this requires the sacroiliac joint to lock or become stable. So probably one of the best ways to look at this is the um, integrated model of function where it is to transfer the loads generated by body weight. And if you have efficient transfer, then you'll get efficient function. So let's look at the anatomy. We need to look at the bony architecture, its ligamentous structure and the muscular structure. So the bony architecture is quite interesting. These are very poorly reproduced from Lawson et al. Um, and this shows uh, on the left, the CT scan of the joint. And then on this side, this is a gross anatomy slide that was in black and white. It's taken directly from Lawson's paper. Um, we can see here that this is in a straight joint, it's curvy. And it's described as having um, ridges and depressions that correspond. And this is to resist shearing stresses on, on the uh, joint itself. So it is a cartilaginous joint. Um, it uh, is high line on one side and I've forgotten another word, chondral on the other side. Um, but it's basically here to re resist the friction and you can see quite nicely in this gross specimen how that actually occurs. Now neonates are born with a very straight sacroiliac joint and these develop as they start learning to walk. So by the time they're five or six, these are already present. So ligamentous, we have external ligaments and we have an internal ligament. So the external ligaments of interest to us are the sacrotuberous ligament down here and the long dorsal sacroiliac ligament, uh, which is all of this here. 
Um, so the uh, sacrotubious ligament helps uh, restrict the movement of the sacrum against the ilium. And in sacroiliac joint land, the word nutation is used for forward bending. And this is because it isn't just a straight uh, forward bend like, like that. It's more a rotation and a bend at the same time. And backward bending is referred to as counter nutation. <clears throat> so this is uh, normal movement. It's meant to happen. Uh, it's only when the movement is excessive that it becomes a problem. And uh, the nutation or the bending forward is limited by the sacrotuberous ligament. And the long dorsal sacroiliac ligament uh, restricts the backwards bending or the counter nutation. The iliolumbar ligament also helps out in this role. Um, and those fibres of all those ligaments are continuous. So now we need to talk about the muscular actions and I think you're all pretty aware of uh, the need for uh, a stabilisation mechanism. And uh, the first one is the role of the transverse abdominis, uh, which I've outlined here. However, we now know due to some lovely work by Andre Vleeming that this force continues to the fascial planes all the way around right to the fascial planes of the multifidus muscle, therefore reinforcing this whole um, uh, force of being able to stiffen the spine prior to movement. And that's the role of the multifidus aided by the um, transverse abdominus muscle. So we know that sacral mutation is the most optimum way to, for the SIJ to transfer force. And what happens when um, the ligamentous or function of the SIJ is disrupted is it tends to stay in sacral counter mutation, which is not a very efficient way to transfer force. You're going to misalign these joint surfaces of the sacrum with the joint surfaces of the ilium. And that's why people find that their stride is shortened. Uh, they feel they can't transfer weight very well. So other words that often get used in, in sacroiliac joint problems are the concept of force and form closure. So form closure refers to any interruption to the uh, structural parts of the sacroiliac joint, so any fractures to the ilium or the sacrum or to the uh, ligaments and force closure is a disruption to the muscular force of closing the joint. Now you do need both of these for a very stable sacroiliac joint. Um, the self-bracing mechanism is uh, putting it together with both the um, ligamentous and the structural issues as well as the uh, muscular issues. You can see you need them all to work for that efficient transfer. So the next group of muscles um, that we need to talk about are these muscle fascia ligament complex and I have to admit to getting absolutely fascinated with fascia. But this provides an integrated sling. So we've got coming down through the, through the um, extensor group, through the sacroiliac joint ligament, long dorsal ligament, through the sacrotuberous ligament, which is the fibres of which are consistent and keep going through onto the biceps femoris muscle. So you can get biceps tendinopathies, distal and, and proximal with uh, secondary problems to the SIJ. And these slings are very important and they will, if, if you lose that uh, initial problem where, uh, where you've got TA being weak or inhibited or um, gluteals being inhibited, these slings will take over and will be overused and they'll also become a source of pain generation. So we talk about the two systems, intrinsic and extrinsic. Um, so we need those innermost layers and we know that when people injure their sacroiliac joints, pain inhibits the function of those innermost layers. So people will often present to you with overactive slings, whether they're the anterior, posterior or sagittal slings, they're all important. So the muscles that fail in uh, the intrinsic muscle are the transverse abdominis and the multifidi or multifetus as some people would say, and diaphragm can become overactive in response to this and pelvic floor can become overactive as a strategy for control. Now the diaphragmatic people will be the ones who are holding their chest in and they may complain of being short of breath. Uh, the pelvic floor people may complain of pelvic floor pain uh, as well, uh, but you need to look for it as a strategy for altered function. So this is a paper I talked about before about um, 
uh, Andre Vleeming's paper and um, activation of TA tensions the multifidus through the connections of the fascia. So that's the image from uh, Vleeming Schwenke. Posterior oblique splings are pretty easy to understand, latissimus dorsi with glute max. And um, you will find that if this is the loose SIJ on this side, then the contralateral latissimus dorsi will become tight. And often that shoulder will be slightly anteriorly rotated as a result of that and predisposes people to shoulder impingement. So anterior oblique things, we have here the oblique muscles of the abdomen. So in uh, external and internal oblique uh, through the pubis with the opposite side adductors. And this is often a source of adductor tendinopathy. This is um, unpublished work. Oh, dear me. What happened there? Uh, it's from a medical student from his, um, uh, from his uh, studies that he did for his um, Bachelor of Medicine. And he did a very lovely anatomical study around the pubis. And he's able to very elegantly show um, the continuity of the fascia of the uh, oblique muscles right through to the adductor longus. Uh, his name is Isaac Louis, and I'm trying to get this published for him. He's just finishing his radiology studies. So, so how do we assess it? Well, we use the um, uh, European guidelines. So we've already talked about the things to look for in history. And we, in the clinical examination, there is not one test. We actually look for clusters as they are more accurate and will increase your kappa value. So I'll talk about imaging a lot later. So we've already talked about the history and people will talk about um, axial loading as being the worst problem. So sitting, standing, walking, running, trying to ascend stairs, getting in and out of the car, turning in bed. And sometimes because of the altered muscle function, they will present with urge incontinence or dyspareunia. Um, we've talked about that, so we don't need to talk about that. Um, so how do I assess it? So firstly, um, from the back, I look for this swelling. I don't know how well that's come up in the photograph, but you can see there does seem to be swelling over the region of the sacroiliac joint. Here we can see evidence of altered muscle function. So firstly, the iliac crests are not even. And we can see that the creases in the shorts are different. And this is showing us that she is using uh, her deep hip external rotators more than her gluteals. So remember that gluteus medius and meniscus are up here. That's also wasted. So you can get clues from the creasing on the shorts. And there's probably a little bit too much of a crease here indicating that the pelvic floor is also being used as a substitution strategy. This lady is exhibiting some other strategies. I think you can see she's unweighting the right very slightly. She's leaning across to her right and we can just see the start of a, a thoracic rotation there. This lady also is showing us the buttock gripping. You can see by the creasing here and the creasing here. And we can see that we're asymmetric here and rotated here. All strategies to try and deal with an asymmetric pelvis that is not sitting in a correct neutral position. Um, that's my iPad we're using there. But this lady is also showing us that she has a very slightly forward foot. So that is indicating that the leg length is not even though I would argue this is a functional leg length difference as opposed to a true leg length difference. Um, this is another one showing that foot slightly forward and also everted. This will alert you to the fact that she is using a um, deep hip rotators as a compensation strategy. So we use a battery of clinical tests. Oh. I don't know why the font just changed there. And this is based on the European guidelines. Um, the standing flexion test is not a validated test, but we still include it amongst our uh, battery of tests. Uh, the stalk relay test has been validated by my good friend, Dr. Barbara Hungerford in her, her doctoral studies. The active straight leg raise test, which has been uh, validated by Jan Menz, a Dutch uh, gynecologist. Um, and the Posterior pelvic pain provocation test, P4 for short, also validated. And the palpation of the long dorsal sacroiliac ligament. If there's pain on that, then 
that these are the four main tests that we use, um, two of function and two of pain. I'll take you through them in a minute. You probably know them well. The sacroiliac joint guide test is a uh, supplementary test. It is not validated. Patrick's test, Gainsland's test are not isolating for the sacroiliac joint. They also will move the hip and the pubis. So should be used as a supplementary test as opposed to a true validation. Okay, so of those major signs, if you get three of the four positive, then it's highly likely then you have sacroiliac joint mechanical dysfunction. So this is a stalk test um, validated by Barb Hungerford. And here I am attempting to show you how to measure this. Um, I have one finger on S1 and another finger. I have gone into PSIS and I've just rotated my thumb out so it's sitting on the iliac crest. The other thing I'm doing is I'm feeling the iliac crest on the other side. So I'm going to feel the movement of the iliac crest. Oh, I'll go back. Sorry. Okay, so as he, this has two phases, a hip flexion phase and a stance phase. So as my patient starts to stand on that uh, right leg, what we should see is the um, ilium should rise up and rotate back into its locked position. So what we want to feel is the ilium rotate backwards and lock. So we're not just looking at what's happening to my right thumb, we're looking um, and feeling for that movement. And the same should happen on the hip flexion phase. It should rise up and lock. So you want to actually feel the movement that the ilium is going through. A positive test is when it fails to lock, you will see that it, it rises up and your thumb stays up and the ilium doesn't come back into a locked position. So this is the active straight leg raise test um, developed by Yarn Men's. And it asks us to lift the leg approximately um, five to seven centimeters off the bed. My subject is doing a little more than that. And you compare the sides. You ask the patient to leave it there for about 10 seconds if they can. Um, then you ask them if it was difficult and what you can observe as an observer is how they do it. And if there is difficulty doing it, you will often see them rotate the whole trunk to the side of the affected side before they lift. This is to allow extra muscle recruitment to, to perform the task. You then compress at the level of the greater trochanter and get them to repeat the, the task and ask if it's easier. And you will see it's easier. You will also maybe see a slight delay of the leg lift. And then we look for, I don't know if this will work, I hope it will. Here we go. So there's the task, the leg lift. And now we're looking at compression to see if it changes. It does. And then what we'll do is bring in that posterior, uh, anteroposterior sling, tension the whole system and ask to repeat again. And you see that um, that is gently um, a lot easier. This is an asymptomatic patient, by the way. And the posterior pain, pelvic pain provocation test, or P4, is just uh, a very gentle push uh, quarterly. So you're going to push downwards to the posterior aspect. And this will stress the posterior long dorsal sacroiliac ligament, which is already on tension in an injured patient, so it will hurt. Uh, I'll just counsel you to do this very gently. It, it can actually hurt people a lot. So it needs to be a girl push, not a boy push. And then you palpate the long dorsal sacroiliac ligament. Um, so starting from the posterior sacroiliac sulcus, follow the ligament down and it will go in an oblique fashion. Now this will change depending on your patient. Women have a much wider sacrum, so it will be more vertical. Men will have a much narrower sacrum. So the minor signs are the passive glides, Faber, Gainsland and Patrick's. Um, so this is um, the sacroiliac joint glide, and this is my colleague Barbara Hungerford showing how it's performed. Um, we test in two directions. We test in an AP direction and a vertical direction. Here she is testing the AP direction. Again, because of the differences in um, uh, people's uh, joints 
uh, and the angles will be different. You have to vary the angle that you glide the joint. And again, I'd counsel you to be very gentle with this. Um, and you're trying to evaluate the relative stiffness of the joint. Um, it becomes a more important factor for those performing manual therapy as it gives them a lot of information on what is actually happening at the joint and where they may need to uh, direct their attention. Now Faber and Patrick seem to have become a little bit interchangeable. Um, I would normally perform a Faber test at 90 degrees of hip flexion and Patrick's in this position that we're demonstrating here. Um, and you are looking for pain reproduction, but it is not isolated to the sacroiliac joint. Hip joint issues will also be painful in this condition. Um, this is a ligamentum teres test. Um, if you have a problem with the hip joint, it frequently gives you sacroiliac joint pain. So the ligamentum teres test is performed in this um, Faber position, so 90 degrees of flexion, 90 degrees of AB duction if you can get it, and then add in rotation. And it's a rotation that will reproduce the pain of a torn ligamentum teres. And the standing flexion test is done with your fingers in both sacroiliac sulcus to see if there's a difference if the uh, sacrum is able to mutate on both sides equally or if one is, is not mutating or the other. However, these have not been fully validated but can be helpful to your assessment. And here is Gainsland's test and again I would counsel you to be careful with this, it can be quite painful. Um, <clears throat> But as I said, it is not just the, the sacroiliac joint that you were testing there. So imaging. Well, plain x-ray, it's probably not going to be helpful unless you've got frank inflammatory sacroiliitis. Same with the CT scan, same with MRI. And nuclear imaging in, in the past has not been helpful. But with the development of SPECT CT, we've been able to develop a very good and reliable test for this. So SPECT CT provides specific imaging patterns that match the clinical diagnosis of SIJ instability, i.e. the failure of that optimal load transfer. So we look for a number of things um, and I'll take you through those things. Uh, and what we see on the, the CT component is we see an increase in the sclerosis. And this is because the joint doesn't ever return to its neutral position. It's always sitting slightly offset. So according to Wolf's law, bones will adapt to the stresses you place on them. So it starts laying down extra bone. And that's what we see reflected here. Um, we also get uh, a change. This is a, an axial view through S2. And we should be seeing a dumbbell shape appearance, which we're not. We get a loss of dumbbell. And we also get an increase in the fluffiness or in the uptake in the external ligaments. We can also view associated issues such as osteitis pubis. I think. Sorry. Um, and we can also see the hamstring insertions and adductor insertions. So what we did is we took 100 consecutive patients. We had uh, identified it on a clinical basis and we applied those criteria. We then had 30 patients who had non-specific low back pain, so they presented with similar pain patterns but did not have those clinical signs. And we had 30 people who were undergoing bone scanning for a totally different reason without back pain, and we compared them. And uh, we found that when we did that, we had a very good sensitivity and specificity and very good positive predictive value. So we do believe that this is, um, could be used as a gold standard. So current views on diagnosing sacroiliac joint dysfunction, um, according to the European guidelines, uh, that's the clinical examination. Uh, the double injection, which is often spouted as a, the um, gold standard, I do not believe is, and I'll take you through that shortly why. And Laslett's pain provocation tests, which were done prior to some of those um, the uh, P4 test hadn't been validated. The um, acne straightly grazed test had not been validated. So they Laslett also used uh, a double injection technique as his gold standard, and therefore I believe he got false results. So with the double injection, local anaesthetic is injected into the synovial portion of the joint, 
and um, this has a high false negative rate as the pain generators are frequently outside the joint and this is from Urakami's work again. Um, so I don't know that I've put Murakami's work in, I thought I had. Um, what Murakami did is he uh, had uh, patients, he had 25 in each group and for 25 he injected the synovial joint, only nine of which got pain relief. The other 25 he injected around the joint. So he didn't inject into the synovial joint, he injected around the long dorsal sacroiliac ligament and he had 25 of his 25 get pain relief. He then went back to the um, 19 of the other group who didn't get pain and injected around the, the joint and they got pain relief. So according to his figures, um, injection into the synovial joint is highly unlikely to confirm your Di your clinical diagnosis and it's unlikely to provide uh, any help to your patient. So if you are thinking of using local anaesthetic and corticosteroid injection, I would strongly suggest you inject around the joint, not in the synovial joint. And this is why I believe that Laslett did not get very good, um, why you can't trust Laslett's figures. And I also believe this is why Schwartz's 13% is probably uh, a little too low. So do I use corticosteroid injections? Incredibly rarely. Um, as I as I stated, they go into the synovial portion of the joint, S3-4. And although they're good to e e decrease the acute inflammatory phase, um, they're likely to be ineffective in more than half your patients, uh, so I don't use them. Um, if you are using a radiologist to do your injection, um, they will only ever inject the synovial portion of the joint. Uh, the, the pain generators are outside the joint and they are those external ligaments that have been working so hard to try and prevent the, the sacrum from going into the mutation and counter mutation. It's a very short term solution, uh, three to four weeks maximum. And if you have access to expert manual therapists, we can get the pain to settle with that manual therapy alone. Uh, a little bit more on these, uh, there's uh, also Berthelet also found that diagnostic blocks uh, were unreproducible. Um, and the, I'm not quite sure what I'm talking about here. Oh yeah, I think we've already talked about why I don't use them. So now getting on to the management strategies, how are you going to manage this patient? Um, we do know from our data that 78% will get better with highly specialised physical therapy and reinstitution of the optimal muscle function. That's pretty high. So four or five patients will get better with that approach. And the re remaining 20% will improve in injection therapies. Now our studies initially were on uh, prolotherapy, which we did CT guided, uh, but more recently I've uh, compared PRP to glucose um, using ultrasound guided injections and found that PRP is superior. So our, our strategies are we treat with manual therapy for optimal alignment and muscle positioning. We maximize the muscular control and here we don't just go into exercise. We see if there is loss of neuromotor control. So we look at the muscle function on ultrasound and EMG biofeedback first before our exercise prescription. We trial bracing uh, to assist and then we, if these things fail we consider uh, injection and surgical fixation which in our long study 1500 patients was only required in 0.2%. Um, it's becoming very popular because there is now minimally invasive surgery to be done and it's being uh, uh, very heavily marketed around the neurosurgery population who don't do any of the other things. So my advice to manual therapists are choose therapies that don't cause pain because remember pain is going to continue to inhibit those stabilizing muscles. Also patients tell me they don't want to go back, it's too painful. So some of the things you can use are muscle energy technique, dry needling, fascial or visceral techniques and I ask my physios to avoid deep tissue massage and uh, elbow pressure can be very painful and it can actually injure the fascia and uh, Carla Stecco and Robert Schleep's work in the fascial world is uh, very interesting to review. So what do we do? Well, we don't just prescribe exercise. Does this patient need neuromotor control, i.e. have those muscles become so inhibited 
the brain can't find them. So we look for that. And if that's what we need to do, we reconnect brain with muscle using those biofeedback techniques. Does this patient just need specific exercise, i.e. they have neuromotor control, but they're um, using all the wrong muscles to do stuff? Or in a general pain world, have they? do we just need to prescribe general exercise? And I have to say, for my uh, patients, it's very rare that we go straight to general exercise. Most of my people, we, we are having to start with neuromotor control. Uh, it's very rare that I'm going straight to specific exercise. So we check the neuromotor control and if it's absence, we commence retraining. We establish an exercise home program using the keep it simple, stupid principle and we don't overwork the patients. We provide them a little. We do emphasise that this is brain retraining and not exercise. We do it for small amounts frequently, otherwise the brain just doesn't cope and we progress to specific exercise and a graduated program. We get them into an exercise class ASAP because we find that they um, a, do the exercise and that they get a lot of um, social benefits from being with people who are also struggling. The other thing we do is we keep them functional. Muscles learn what you teach them in the position you teach them. So uh, if you're doing something in a non-functional position, the exercises may not translate to strength in the activities that your patient needs, such as walking, standing, sitting, arising. Um, and here I'm talking about uh, muscles such as exercises such as clams, which are found absolutely useless. So we contract the, contract the muscle in isolation, then we teach it in combination, and then they combine with functional activity. So how do we do this? Um, ultrasound uh, to look at the function and this is an ultrasound taken on a not very expensive machine that uh, physios may have in practice and we can see here our three layers of muscle external oblique internal oblique and transverse abdominis here we can see what happens when they contract and here we do see that we have got a good contraction of transverse abdominis. Remember, it's a very small muscle. Um, it's mainly type 1 fibers. It's the, it's the dude that does all the stabilization. It's meant to be on all the time working in the background. It's not powerful. And here you see an incorrect contraction where, yes, TA has activated, but look at what internal oblique has done. Um, so we don't want internal oblique working excessively in minor strategies. So the bracing. Um, this is a small sacroiliac joint belt. It can be uh, worn, it needs to be worn around at the level of the pubis to get the compression of the sacroiliac joint. Some people do not tolerate these because they dig in a little too much, which means the sacrofix shorts that we're seeing here uh, may be a little bit more comfortable. We did a study on these showing their e efficacy uh, in acute SIJ injury. We were able to decrease the pain by 50% for those initial uh, presentations. So injection therapies, when do we proceed? Well, if our specialised physical therapy has uh, failed or if our patients are having difficulty regaining neuromotor control, particularly gluteals, it seems that there's some sort of biofeedback to the gluteals to switch off when the sacroiliac joint is uh, non-functional. So, this is a, uh, an imaging of the prolotherapy technique uh, done CT guided. Um, I think now that we probably used not the right recipe here, we inherited the recipe from a, an orthopedic colleague. Uh, we were using a small amount of glucose with marcaine and a dash of contrast. And we now know that putting the local anaesthetic in with the injection was probably decreasing the effect it was having. So we were doing single injections, not multiple injections to the extra articular areas. And we just did it to the dorsal interosseous ligament. So we went interosseous, which again, Vellini's group has shown is the key ligament to the joint. When they dissected that one, the whole joint fell apart. Um, it was radiologically guided and it's different to the classical theory of um, prolotherapists. Our technique was specific, measurable, and it worked. And the reason we did this is um, at the time that we did this work, there was a lot of um, disbelief that the classical prolotherapy could work. So we were using a technique that our colleagues 
could uh, understand. It was radiologically guided and the only thing we were doing differently was the substance we were using. So I, I transferred to um, PRP and ultrasound guided and initially I was using a sonocyte edge and I was using a linear transducer. Uh, I've now uh, switched to uh, predominantly using a curvilinear transducer and I use a GE logic machine. So I wait for six weeks because I'm waiting for ligamentous healing. Um, so if you, I get them to avoid loaded activities. We resume closed chain activities and we resume, resume their strength training. And we tend to use uh, rowing or paddling, walking in water um, and deep water running uh, to maintain aerobic activity. So in summary, what we do is we try specialized physical therapy that's gonna work for four out of five patients, plus bracing or taping, and then consider injection therapies, and then you return to activity considerations, which may be workplace-based or uh, sport. Oh, there we go. I've got to the end. That, that popped up quickly. Thank you, Dr. Jenny. That was a very comprehensive and very lengthy lectures of the SI joint. Now we understand clearly what is all about SI joint. <laughs> but we have some questions here. Is it okay? Please. Uh, I'll be reading a lot of questions. The first one comes from Samar Kumar Shah. This question was, uh, any association with piriformis syndrome? Uh, yes, absolutely. Um, when the gluteals, glute meter minimus, stop working, the deep hip rotators take over, and that includes piriformis and the small uh, deep hip rotators, particularly obturator internus and externus, and they will take over that role, so they become hypertonic. So when you're diagnosing piriformis syndrome, I would strongly suggest to you, you need to look further and look at the reason why your patient has it. What is the underlying problem? Have they got a, an unstable SIJ that's caused it? Is it, um, you, you'll get altered muscle function from other back injuries too. Any pain will stop it, stop the normal function. So you need to find the driver, otherwise you won't fix it. Nice, nice. Uh, so it's uh, it's like a secondary reaction to an existing problem already, right? So the next question is how to differentiate a myofascial pain syndrome affecting muscles in this region versus SI joint pathology? So how do you differentiate a myofascial pain problem? Syndrome. Yes. Okay. Um, they're, they're linked because... Um, Again, it's the same thing. You have a myofascial problem, but is there an underlying driver? Why, have, why has this individual developed it? Um, so when, you, when I see a myofascial problem, and I do see them a lot, what is the reason this has developed? Why has this person lost normal function of the stabilizing muscles? Why are they overusing the slings which connect through the fascia? Um, so again, it's not just good enough to know what the problem is. You also need to know and understand why. I see. I see. Thank you. Uh, another question is, can pelvic organ prolapse induce or worsen an SI joint pain? Yes, pelvic uh, organ prolapse can, can be associated and can get worse. A number of reasons are behind this. Um, the pelvic floor itself is one of the major stabilizers of that intrinsic system. And so when you have a pelvic floor prolapse, you have lost that portion of the stabilization and um, therefore remember we talked about 80% of people getting better with just reinstituting muscular function people with a pelvic floor prolapse will not be able to do that because they've got a structural reason for that muscle not being able to support the pelvis so um, it is intricately linked and in those cases uh, the SIJ problem is muscular not ligamentous so it's due to force closure problems and uh, you will need to address the, the prolapse first. I see. Next question is, how common is SI joint dysfunction in association with postpartum ostitis pubis? How common is it postpartum? How common is SI joint dysfunction in association with postpartum ostitis pubis? It's very common. 
And uh, the work they're doing out of Scandinavia is predominantly postpartum. And you'll see that you can expect 50% of women, particularly those from their second pregnancies on, will have, uh, they call it pelvic girdle pain there. So if you're looking through the literature, don't look up SIJ, look up pelvic girdle pain uh, for whatever reason. I think it's their medico politics. Um, they will say 50% of women in uh, more than their second pregnancy will have it during pregnancy and that group is drops to 30%. So it is actually quite high. And if you are looking at an osteitis pubis, consider the SIJ. They are on the same bone. They are suffering the same problems. So you need to treat that pelvis as a whole. I see. Okay, next question is, uh, what medication can we inject to SI joint and how much is the dose? I think that was answered already. What is the worst complication of injection? What structure we should aware when we do injection? Okay, so um, when I'm doing, uh, when I'm trying to repair the ligament, I predominantly use PRP and I use a low white cell count, low um, red cell count PRP. I inject high, I inject into the ligamentous portion, which is at S1, S2. And uh, the answer to your question is how much, is how, however much I can get in. <laughs> it yeah. might be one mil, it might be two, it might be three. Um, it's very rarely more than three. Um, so I am provoking uh, a healing response in the patient. I want their natural inflammatory and repair process to kick in. So I advise them that the next two to three days they're going to have the inflammatory response. It could be worse. It might increase their pain for a little, so I advise them to rest. Uh, I avoid anti-inflammatory medication. I just use paracetamol-based medication, either with codeine or tramadol for pain in that period. I, I warn them about the muscular tightness that's going to happen as part of that repair process. And um, we don't do anything for two weeks. We wait for that repair to get a little bit sticky before they see their physio. And we um, then restart uh, gentle uh, muscle retraining, making sure their pelvic floor is working, making sure their transverse abdominus is working. And if, if they're up to it, uh, reinstituting gluteal function. So we do it that way. Um, all the complications I have, uh, I've never had an infection. They're all related to the, well, I don't regard them as complications, but all the things that happen to patients are related to the normal uh, inflammation and process of repair process that we all learn about in pathology. Um, I have had one, one episode of Mayferner syndrome on the injected side. Mayferner syndrome is um, compression of the external iliac vein. And the patient presented with a, a slightly swollen leg say, saying, why is my leg swollen? And I believe what happened is it was, if you look at the anatomy of the uh, external iliac artery vein, it's very closely related to the psoas muscle. And she had a tendency to overuse her psoas. So when it became shortened and hypercontracted, it compressed. Uh, she's been treated conservatively and has had no issues. And I have done in excess of 3,000 of these injections. So um, at this stage, that's the only complication I have had. I see. Thank you. Any role of sonography imaging during the diagnosis? Um, sorry, what was that, Gemma? What is the role of uh, ultrasound imaging in the diagnosis? Um, I don't use ultrasound imaging to diagnose, but when I'm going to do the injection, I very much do look at the um, long dorsal sacroiliac ligament, at the external one, and the ilia lumbar. Uh, the reason I do that is there's, um, I measure them, uh, they can be thickened, and we look at the difference between sides, and you can sometimes see interstitial tears in that ligament. Uh, and if there is an interstitial tear in that ligament, I'll uh, inject that with PRP as well. Okay. Um, the other question is uh, has to do with the PRP. How, how how many spin do you do you do with the PRP? Is it single spin um, or double spin? Okay. Well, I use a PRP that's gel separated. So if you use a gel separated PRP, you virtually have no red cells in it anyway, like 0.09. So you don't need a second spin. And the the good news about the um, gel separated PRPs is that they also capture most of the um, granular sites which can also break down your repair. So you end up with a low white cell count, 
low red cell count PRP on just one spin. Now that they are lower in um, platelet counts, but if you look at the research data, you'll find that their recovery of growth factors is very similar to some of those with high. For instance, um, region is a region BCT tube is uh, a low white cell, low red cell, low platelet recovery. It's 1.5, 1.6 times, and um, Arthrex is a high one with five times platelet recovery. But if you look at the um, expression of growth factors, they are similar. So I think there's more to it than just looking at cell counts. I think we do need to look at, at, um, at recovery factors. Um, so um, it's more than just that. But the gel separators are good. And I, I, they're very convenient because you've only got one spin. It's, it's five or 10 minutes, depending on which system you use and uh, really easy to extricate as well. Okay, I have, I have a, a question also, Dr. Jen. Um, it has to do with, you mentioned about uh, when you inject, you inject uh, the ligament around the sacroiliac joint, and then at the same time you inject at the synovial joint. Is that what you're saying? No, um, I don't inject the synovial joint at all. I, I don't worry about it. It's not the pain generator. It may be if you've got someone with inflammatory SIJ issues from like um, angspond or rheumatology problems, but it's, it isn't the pain generator for those with mechanical. So I just don't inject it. Okay, so you just inject around the area then? Around yeah, I do. Um, on ultrasound, you can see the iliolumbar ligament quite nicely. And so I, I inject along the length of that from uh, sort of S1 to S3. I see. Great, great. Uh, there are other, uh, well, somebody is asking, where, where is the site to refer to to teach people from far-flung areas? Let's maybe uh, he's asking about any specific uh, area where they can refer patients with SI joint problems, maybe, or uh, uh, they're asking about location where you can refer them? Do you have any site for people who may have some issues? Um, I haven't, but I could put one together because um, I know where I've been lecturing and I know where people do have and are developing interests. So it's possible I can assist that way. Um, there are some people in Singapore, um, Hong Kong, um, in Australia, um, I've got a few colleagues that, that can help out. Some in Sydney, uh, Perth, Brisbane, Great. Uh, Tasmania. <laughs> <laughs> so pretty, pretty far flung. Um, but um, it, it, it is a developing area and I think it's been ignored for a long time. Right. And um, what we were taught how to diagnose, we now know is wrong. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and we can get much better at it clinically. So I'm trying to get that, that, that out there, hence my um, you know, willingness to talk today, because um, this is a totally fixable problem. And this is something you can help people with. You don't have to condemn people to a lifetime of pain and dysfunction. Yeah, and probably Dr. Jim in the Philippines, Dr. Jen, you can come by when everything is better and you could teach this technique to us. Yeah, I'd love to. I, I do have a workshop program. I'm trying to get that up online as well. But I understand that sometimes in 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 face-to-face uh, -face is much better. But uh, I've done some in Singapore uh, already and I we had to abandon one we had planned for March, <laughs> unfortunately. But... Um, uh, yeah, I'd, once we're able to travel again, that would be lovely. I'd, I'd love to meet you all in person. Yeah. Dr. Jen, I have one more question for you. Is, is that okay? Yeah, fine. <laughs> okay. Do you see a combination, let's say, of a sports hernia and uh, a sacroiliac joint dysfunction altogether? And yeah, you, you can. Address mm. Yeah, you can get any any of these dysfunctions around the pelvis. Um, and uh, are likely to be due to, as we talked about, we've got force closure and form closure. So if, if you've got a structural issue, then all the muscles are going to have to work really hard to try and hold people together. And different people adopt different patterns. So if they start overusing the internal, external oblique, 
um, as their go-to strategy, then they can force the tear on the conjoint tendon, producing that, that hernia. So my approach to anyone who's coming in with adductor tendinopathy, biceps tendinopathy, osteitis pubis, sportsman's hernia, anything around that pelvis, I will always look for an underlying cause. It's not good enough for me to know what the problem is. I want to know what the underlying cause is. What forced the change in their muscle function that this developed? So yes, generally, I, I, I agree. Um, I would look for an underlying cause if you have a sportsman's hernia. I see. Well, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Jan, and uh, thank you for your time. I know you're quite busy, and uh, I've, I've seen that you're going from place to place. So I hope you're safe and make sure you're, you're not uh, in the midst of COVID. So just be very careful. And uh, we thank you and appreciate your time with us today. Thank you so much for your invitation. Yeah, thank you. So looking forward to more face-to-face -face, uh, workshops in the future. Let us know uh, if you have anything, you just email it to us and then you will uh, spread the word. So okay. I, I do have one up on my website on um, basic PRP to understand it if anybody's interested and I'll send you the link Jim Lowe. and I'm assuming you would like the PDFs of the lecture yes 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 I'll yes. send them to you also okay. thank you so much so, so I appreciate and all your generosity you're so nice you're so good thank you very much thank you and thank all our people so is it all right if I post this in our YouTube we have a YouTube channel and yeah that's fine okay thank you thank you thank you so we'll post this in the Facebook uh, in the YouTube channel and everybody who would like to review them again, you can come back and uh, try to see them. Thank you very much and have a good day. Thank you.